morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you're calling in from around the world. My name is Sandy Hart, and along with Ann Smith and Laura Sapele Lafuia, <laughs> Ava, I welcome you to our final call of the General Congress of Women, our 12-month series addressing each of the Beijing 12 critical areas of concern. Each month, the highest caliber of speakers share their wisdom and expertise so that we could do uh, or be better equipped, I should say, to address these issues head on. Each call has also been held in a sacred manner by a grandmother or elder representing the original peoples, uh, who also share her wisdom and knowledge. And this month, we will do the same. As timing will have it, and because all of our calls are scheduled on the 21st of the month, this call lands on the winter solstice. Um, we don't think that was an accident or an idle coincidence. The winter solstice is a time to reflect and question assumptions and patterns that no longer serve us. Uh, the most pervasive messaging into our lives is through the media. So this conversation on women and media is so important and we believe a great way to conclude our series. Uh, we're thrill thrilled to welcome our three guests today, Sandra de Castro Buffington, Yancina Larson, and Shauna Blue Star Newcomb, women who are making big changes in the way media is used and women are impacted. We thank each of you for tuning in to this virtual sacred circle from the four corners of the earth, and also to our members, ambassadors, alliance partners, sponsors, who have all made this series possible and trust and support us is invaluable. Thank you. Stay tuned for how the series will expand into 2022 and our sacred circles for the soul conversations where we're taking these conversations and these topics over the last 12 months into our hearts and addressing them through our, our, our diverse faith traditions, um, secular ethics, our, our cultural ways. This, which is what we get to do here at Sarah and we have done so well for nearly 20 years. Uh, this webinar is recorded, so you can listen to it again and again, and you will also receive an email with all the links and resources, so you don't need to take copious notes. Sit back, relax, practice your sacred listening, so you can deepen and, and listen into and absorb the, these women's collective wisdom. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have time in our, our after party for questions and answers and to also hear from you. And at the General Congress of Women, we have a vision statement, and that is growing the collective power of grassroots women through collaboration and action that is restorative and regenerative. So now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Shauna Blue Star Newcomb. Let me bring you here with me, Shauna. Shauna, first of all, does not is not a grandmother or an elder but a profound <laughs> voice of original people. So in my book, she is an elder in terms of her wisdom and her original knowledge that you're about to witness here today. She is Shani Lenape Zapotex, and you will soon find out how she is opening hearts and minds around the world, sharing profound universal messages to navigate these times of uncertainty. She collaborates with her father, Stephen Newcomb, on a global movement for conscious change and reveals hidden history behind current day challenges with a unique way forward. Shauna supports speakers and change makers with her healing and spiritual guidance to thrive in the new paradigm. She shares powerful insights to help people around the world connect with her authentic power and intuition through her teachings and online courses sacred feminine rising and the reference code reset that's those are her two uh, uh, uh workshops uh sacred feminine rising and the reverence code reset let me get that right uh, shauna is dedicated to a vision of healing for all peoples the planet and future generations and thank you shauna for opening our call today thank you um it's very good as i said to be here with all of you and just sending um, blessings during this time of the solstice, uh, the time of the full moon and beautiful closing of this time and opening to what's to come in the future. And we always like to begin in a sacred way, honoring the original nations and the original lands of the peoples, wherever you may be. So just thinking of that and bringing our hearts into the center together as we're just taking a deep breath in. And I like to bring a, a prayer from my Shawnee Lenape background. Um, it's very 
deeply meaningful to be able to speak a few words of Lenape with you. Kuhana Gishela Mieng Wanishi. Oak Wama Wiltike Kuhana Milian Wanishi. Pio Kendekeshok. Pechio He Kamakana Yushienta. Wita Kamika. Milian En Wellamasa Wakan. Wilatana Mawakan. Milian En Wiltek Tanakan. Ichi Kaski Igalichi. Pechi Petalsen En Yushienta. Wita Kamika. Manelikesh. We give thanks for all of the good things that you give to us, Creator. We give thanks for the waters and the sun shining upon us on this earth. We ask that you bring us good health and happiness. You bring us a good road to walk upon so that we can live a longer life on this earth. We send blessings to all of the peoples, the, the lands, the waters, the lakes, the oceans. We bless the soils and Mother Earth for the good food that nourishes our bodies. We bless the lands and the mountains, the peaks and valleys, Pachamama Gaia. We bless the animals, the birds, the fish, winged ones, and all beings of this earth. We remember to honor ourselves and each other as sacred beings, knowing that we are connected to the earth and the cosmos and the all that is. We bless each other, our dear brothers and sisters, mothers, fathers, and all people of our human family. We know that all things are interconnected. We pray for the children and the future generations, for the elders, the ancestors, and the healing of the great feminine, sacred feminine, and the sacred masculine. May we come into balance, honoring with this reuni reunion of both, with love, honor, and respect. This is a beautiful day, and we give great thanks for being here in the circle. Sending blessings out to all of you, Wanishi. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Shauna. That was such a beautiful sacred blessing to welcome us all in to the sacred circle. Thank you, my dear. Aloha, everyone. I have the honor and privilege of welcoming Sandra de Castro Buffington. She is a global leader in social impact entertainment and a pioneer in conscious media. Sandra's groundbreaking work with Hollywood and international creative communities has ignited new narratives of transforming and innovation worldwide. Narratives of transformation and innovation worldwide. She has worked in over 50 countries for well over 50 plus years on behalf of women, girls, and families. As the founder and president of Story Action, founder and former director of UCLA's Global Media Center for Social Impact and former director of USC's Hollywood Health and Society. Sandra has worked with film, television, and emerging media professionals to accurately and consciously reflect the most important topics of our time from rape culture to human trafficking immigration to mass incarceration, health to sustainability, nonviolence and nonviolence to mindfulness. She is the co-producer of the film Brainwash, Sex Camera Power, that will have its European premiere at the Berlin Sundance. Sandra is quoted as saying, we are pulling back the veil on ways in which shot design promotes sexual abuse and employment discrimination against women and pave the way to a new form of storytelling that can transform our world. Welcome, welcome, Sandra. And I have the honor of asking the first question to you. Um, please tell us about the importance of understanding how women in the media are objectified. Thank you so much, uh, Laura Sa and Shauna and Sandy and all of you here today. It's really an honor to speak with you. Um, I just want to go back and say um, I've only been working, I, when I worked in 50 countries, it wasn't over 50 years, not quite that, <laughs> that mature <laughs> yet. Um, but I'd like to start by invoking my maternal lineage. My mother who was from Brazil, 
um, my grandmother, Vanda, who I was very close to, my great-great-grandmother, who was Coruripe Indian from Alagoas, Brazil, and my daughter, Ana Lucia, um, who lives here in the US. And I'd like to invoke the maternal lineages of all of us present. Okay, that makes me cry already, and I'm just getting started. <laughs> um, so Laura Saw, thank you for that question about objectification of women on the screen. And I'm going to get there to an answer, but nothing in my life has been a straight line. It's always been, you know, a, a course that I can't see. It may look meandering, and yet there's always been a kind of divine guidance. So I'm going to start by quoting Mary Oliver, Oliver, the poet. She said, this is the first, the wildest, and the wisest thing I know, that the soul exists and is built entirely out of attentiveness. And I'd like to really stay with this theme of attentiveness or this kind of acute presencing. Um, the way that, and we'll, we'll do that, we'll turn our attentiveness to what we're seeing on the screen and the way it treats women. But I'd like to tell you a little of my own journey. So I grew up uh, Brazilian American, you know, be, really navigating these two worlds and two cultures, bicultural. I was bilingual and then multilingual later in my childhood. So I grew up knowing that there wasn't one reality. And I, I, I guess my question to all of you in the audience today is how many of you also grew up attentive to that things were not exactly as they seem, that there might be a deeper reality of play. And when I was a young adult, I was 18 years old, I was really seeking answers because I did not see myself in the dominant culture or in the narrative that had been crafted for me. So I went on a quest and I went back to South America thinking that I might find the answers to the meaning of life for me among indigenous people or among people who lived in very remote parts of Brazil, Bolivia, and Argentina. And I thought I would go on this quest for two months and it ended up being five years <laughs> of living there. And I'll share with you, let's see if I can share screen, a photo. Um, so let me see, I'm gonna need a little help to share this screen. Um, and here we go, share screen. Okay, so share, there we go. And I'll bring this back and play. There we go. So this is when I was 19 years old and living in a very remote part of Brazil. I lived among people who taught me how to live in harmony with the forces of nature. That requires great attentiveness. There was no distraction, no running water, no electricity, no roads, no out. We were there together and it connected me to a community and gave me a sense of belonging I'd never had before. And I was taught many things, but one thing I'll share is that at night, the children would come to my hut and they would teach me their songs. And it was through the songs that I fell in love with these cultures and I fell in love with story because each song was a story. It told of the past, it told of the present, it told of the heartache, the heartbreak and the aspirations. And it actually predicted the future. So let me just say, you know, let me come back here. All right, we'll do this. Am I still sharing screen? Good. So how are we to treat others? There are no others. This is Ramana Maharshi. This is one of the things I learned. There are no others. And I knew, knew I'd spend the rest of my life, I'm now in my early to mid twenties, giving back in some small way. And I made a deal with the universe. I will work so hard, but I have two conditions. The work has to be meaningful. It has to serve. It has to uplift people who uh, are really underrepresented in society, especially women. 
That was one condition. And the other is it has to be global because I was already a global citizen. So I ended up going to grad school in public health and being sent back to Brazil to work in reproductive health and family planning, which I did, this is what I did over 20 years in close to 50 countries. And my first project was this very sexy looking um, 30 second spot, it was animated. And it was about acts of love and it was promoting vasectomy, promoting male involvement in contraception instead of always the onus being on women. It increased vasectomy. It aired, by the way, during primetime TV. I'd never worked with media before. I felt like I didn't know what I was doing, but it increased the vasectomy by 80% in Sao Paulo. It won seven international awards. I'd never even heard of these awards. Seriously, this was such a new world to me. But it woke me up to the power of story. And while that animated spot may look very sexy and even inappropriate for certain cultures, I did so much research and pre-tested the heck out of it. It was appropriate for Brazil. Fast forward 20 years working in the real world, I end up being invited to come to Hollywood. So to go from working with the real world to working with the fake world of story. And my job was to connect writers and producers of Hollywood with researchers, with communities and real people with real stories, with story whispers like me to create stories that would awaken human consciousness and ignite change. So I came here not knowing what to do. I had no idea how to do my job. And so I kept, I meditated a lot and I tuned in and I developed these methods, which I'm gonna share with you, but it led to in my first three years of work, 565 storylines on 91 shows across 35 networks on things like prison reform and immigration and gender equality and violence against women and LGBTQ, you name the topic, we probably addressed it. And then I wanted to promote more global health in television and movies. And I started a story tour series. And here we are in the city dump of Mumbai, India. And that was one of my story tours. Take writers and producers out of Hollywood and into places they would never go on their own. This is about inspiration and grounding stories so they're accurate and realistic. And this is the second largest slum in the world, Dadavi, with one of our script writers. And I did a series of story tours locally. And I started focusing the industry on human trafficking, rape culture, and sexual consent. And it led to, and I'm actually not going to show you the clip because we're going to run out of time. But one of the writers who came with me on my rape culture story tour was from Grey's Anatomy. And it ended up, she wrote, she got inspired, she was informed, she wrote this episode, Silent After All These Years. And it was the most touching story about a survivor of sexual assault who is being wheeled down this long hallway. And this is the very hallway we saw, they recreated it to have surgery to repair her injuries. And all the women in the hospital came to support her. Makes me cry every time I watch this. All lined up just to stand in silent witness and support for this woman who was terrified. And what was the result? Af immediately after this story aired, there was a 43% increase in calls to the national rape hotline number in this country. 43%. That's the power of story. This is another story. On, I took a group to South Africa. When we were in Soweto, I had Hollywood writers and producers with me. We heard a story about a community solution to domestic violence. And that solution was that Instead of ignoring violence, when, when violence was heard, the community members would run to their kitchens and grab a pot or a pan and a utensil, and they'd all go and stand at the doorstep of the home where the violence was taking place and bang and clang and bang and clang and bang and clang and say, we see you, we're witnessing this. We will not stop making this banging and clanging until the violence ceases. 
It was a nonviolent form of protest. And this writer put it into the third episode of this show, Touch. And this practice spread also was put in a TV show in South Africa and it spread across the country and it spread to other countries as well. This is a, an episode of Law and Order Special Victims Unit. And I worked with Mariska Hargate, the actor, on ending the rape kit backlog in this country. And I am going to show you this 30 second clip from this episode. I guess I'm not, it's not there. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll go back. I, I guess I took the clips out thinking we wouldn't have time. This episode um, ended up, we, we had four partners and before this episode aired, Human Rights Watch was involved. Huffington Post, Nick Kristoff of the New York Times, NBC.com. We sent a 30 second clip of this show to our partners and they tweeted it out and they posted calls to action and 35 news outlets picked up this story. We said, invite your local chief of police to a, a viewing party at your home with your friends and have a conversation. This led to national policy change and the New York Times tracked for two years stories about the rape kit backlog. And in 2020, a bill passed authorizing $150 million per year to end the rape kit backlog in this country. This is the power of story, transformative story. Now let's go back to our attentiveness. I'd like to share a little bit about our film Brainwashed, Sex Camera Power. It's based on the work of Mina Menkes, our director, who gave a talk called Sex and Power, the Visual Language of Cinema. And she was noticing these elements that perpetuated through the visual language, sexual assault and abuse of women and employment discrimination against women. So she brought me in to the first conversation. We, we, there are three of us women sitting at a table and talking about creating this film. It, within a month, we had the funding and we started shooting the year before the pandemic. And so we have spent the last three years making this film, two and a half maybe. And what we've pulled out are these five elements, which are now called the Menke's list. And these are elements that have been in full view all of our lives, and yet we never saw them. We all were brainwashed because we all went to the same movies and we just thought this is just the way it is. And so we have over 175 clips of movies from the famous directors in the world to illustrate these five points. And so I'm gonna try to drill down a little bit for you and then I'm gonna close and, and pass the baton. But number one is called point of view. So generally in films, we are looking through the male point of view at who's the subject, it's usually the male subject. We look at the woman as the object. So it's always through this male gaze, the woman is objectified. She is eroticized and there for his sexual pleasure and not just his, but also for the audience. And the, the intention of these stories is usually for a male audience. So this is point of view through the male gaze. Then we go to number two, which is framing. Have you ever noticed the way women's bodies are fragmented on the screen? In movies, you know, you see a cleavage or you see a rear end or you see the legs. It's fragmented parts of women shown. This is fragmentation. It fragments and isolates us and eroticizes us as objects. Number three is camera movement. That includes slow-mo. Do you, have you noticed the way the camera pans in slow motion up the body of the woman? And this is another way of objectifying her. And then lighting. And now here you can see generally men are in 3D lighting. 
and women are in this fuzzy fantasy lighting. And in, when a character is in 3D lighting, there's you see lines and expression in the face. You can see this as a thinking human being with an inner life. When we're in fantasy lighting, it's like we don't really exist. And the fifth element is narrative position. Have you ever noticed, so this is the famous uh, movie Carrie, uh, directed by Brian De Palma. And this is a scene where it's a group of women in a locker room. They, they're sports, they've just been playing sports. They're in the locker room and all of a sudden cut to this weird scene with this actress in the shower to, being very eroticized. It has nothing to do with the storyline. It's just completely out of the story. And, and it's just a moment where the camera can objectify her. So these are the five elements. I hope you'll see the film. You will never see movies or TV or anything on a screen the same way again. And, you know, I, I was thinking about what is the opposite of objectification? It's respect. I think I started writing this, uh, oh, that's different, but it is respect and valuing another. And that's our antidote to this problem is how do we tell stories that really respect and uplift and value and give dignity and worth to the other. And that's what we want for all women. So in closing, we're here to awaken from the illusion of our separateness. Okay, that was what I was saying. And close with Mary Oliver, said the river, imagine everything you can imagine, then keep on going. That's what we're called to do today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Real quick, allow me to pop in, um, Anne, real quick before we hand this over to Anne. Sandra, if you send me those links, I will include them in the final recording version of this and then also send them out to our audience. Those now, that you how, do I, how do I close out of this? Oh, um, look, look for your um, stop share button. I think it's. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Did it work? Okay. There we go. Thank you Great. so much. And now let's thank bring. You so much. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sandra. And it uh, is a perfect, perfect introduction to our next speaker, because that is what Jensen Larson has done. She has told the authentic stories. She has brought them to life. She has created an incredible network. So I am so proud and happy that all of you are on the show and to introduce you, uh, Jensen Larson, also young when she went to the Amazon forest at, she was I think 19, as a journalist. And she heard the stories of the women who were starving. Their families were starving because of the oil contamination. And then she continued to go on and travel and she heard more and more stories that of, uh, of women who, who were voiceless and we didn't hear it. And of course it was never in the media. So how do you bring these voices to the world? How do you make these connections? As we've been, we have a chance, women uniting the world that we say at the end, how do you bring these women, these powerful women together for uniting the world? And I love this story and you can tell it again in your own words, Yancina, because I love that you were looking at the stars and all of a sudden they started to pulsate. And these pulsing st stars told you to create world pulse and what an amazing story so um it she started out you started out with a print magazine but it wasn't going to get to the throughout the world so then it went to a digital media gain moment and it gained tremendous momentum i can remember going to conferences and hearing about it and listening to you talk and we were all so excited about this new tool for us as women to be empowered, our voices and to be connected. And then it has now 
as an independent women-led global set social network for social change with 80,000 network members, 227 countries and territories representing 21,600,000 reported lives changed worldwide. Now that is women in the media. So my pleasure to welcome you and please elaborate on your story about the, the stars if you want and whatever you want to say. Um, but you have created the solutions and tell us more about women in the media for take for real social change. Thank you. Woo. Thank you. Anne and, and Sandra, wow, um, so many similarities in our stories that I think um, is not an accident. Um, and I love to talk story like all of us here. So I'm gonna tell some stories. I'll tell the origin story of World Pulse as well, but uh, just a little bit about the truth of who I am. And it's been my job for the last decade to listen deeply to the voices and stories of primarily women from every single country of the world. And at this moment in every cell of my body, I believe that the combination of women's leadership, of media and technology is going to supercharge a global women's revolution, a digital revolution that has the potential to get us to gender justice and gender equity in 10 years, not the 130 that's currently projected. We've slipped back a generation in terms of our progress in the last year. And so, you know, women's leadership we know is an accelerator, technology and media we know is an accelerator. You put them together and you're going to get a rocket boost. And I believe that what we started to see with the, the Me Too movement, it's really only the tip of an iceberg of what's to come. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's coming and how we can make it happen, but I've really been learning um, how to create this roadmap as a shy international journalist, I, I had to figure out, I had to tinker to find out how to build this safe online environment where women, even, even the shy ones could, could speak that would activate them to make bigger change offline in their communities. And you know, one of the basic ingredients, essential ingredients is, is that we have to transform models in the media and tech industry to center those voices that are most often left out, that are most often excluded. And I believe that if we do that, we're literally going to build the infrastructure for what's next after Me Too and just have a, a massive, massive unlocking of women's voices globally. And what I will do is share some stories. So I'm going to Put on some images here. And, you know, some of you may have uh, had a chance to log on to World Pulse, but I encourage you to. It, today, it, it is a network unlike any other on the online universe. It's the voices of over 80,000 mostly women and allies are speaking out, they're connecting from 227 plus countries and territories, and they are going on to impact millions more. But there's a one story I'll share that really illustrates what's happening on World Pulse. So there was a moment um, a few years ago when I suddenly got a flurry of notifications on my cell phone that was um, bing, bing, bing. And I saw that there was a message on World Pulse from a woman named Beatrice in rural Uganda, who uh, ha her headline was, help, I don't know what to do. And you click into her story, you continue to read. And she basically is saying, you know, my, my brother, my last brother uh, died an hour ago. He was my last surviving brother of seven. Um, and he had died of HIV and AIDS. And because he was the last surviving male heir, the village elders were going to come and they were gonna take away the land 
that they were living on, the land of her mother, her grandmother, all the children, of course, that they had adopted. And um, she was desperate. And I kept scrolling down her story and I saw there were comments just kind of rolling in from women from India, from Canada, from Spain. They were saying, uh, we're here for you. You know, what can we do? Or I'm a legal expert. I have, I, I know that in Uganda, you actually have legal rights to that land. They don't have to take it away from you. Um, I will help consult with you. Um, there was just this huge outpouring of support. Well, the next morning I woke up and the, there was a new message. And the message basically said, well, the village elders came, my mother and I, we stood our ground in the front of the house in our doorway and we told the, the elders, we are not moving, uh, we have rights. If you try and take our land away, there literally are women from all around the world that are gonna come and, on airplanes and stand with us. And so today they do have title to their land. And in fact, the, um, the whole community is now aware of their land rights and women are, are uh, taking part in their land rights across the entire region. And Beatrice just really decided to pay it forward. And she decided to um, work with rural girls who like herself, who wouldn't normally have had a chance to get an education who are being married off at age 11. So she started matchmaking them online to mentors and really got over 500 girls, uh, mentors and funding and into school. And today those girls are now going to college. And these are just a few of the photos that she shared on World Pulse of these girls finding out they've been accepted into universities with their mothers and with their grandmothers. And just this real cascade, this, this shift in generations um, and lineage in their community. But also Beatrice has started um, you know, ma major enterprises and, and, and so much more. So, Basically, this is the power of just one voice that can, can be heard in the wilderness and be supported by a community of women within literally just minutes and what that can do, how that can really turn the tide. The origin of World Pulse started um, as a dream, as a young girl. This is the, the land behind the barn where I grew up in the rural Midwest, this is my secret spot. This is where I would come, I was homeschooled and I would just carry my stack of books up behind the barn and I would, I would read and um, I would dream about, about traveling to far away lands. But in my, whenever I was in public places, my voice was really trapped in my throat. I felt paralyzingly shy. I don't know if any of you have had that feeling of just a burning <laughs> inside of you that, that needs to come out. And that was, um, that was me when I was younger. But as I started to grow older, I realized that I wanted to see the world. And I uh, actually at 19 years old, which is kind of like Sandra, which is interesting at that, that same timeline. But I ended up traveling to the Ecuadorian Amazon. And I was hearing a calling to go behind the pages of the books to really hear the stories of women um, behind the media because I knew I, what I was seeing on the news wasn't really the truth. So I, I went to the Ecuadorian Amazon and these are some incredible friends that I made, but you can see the oil contamination on their traditional lands and impact their children. You know, we're gaining stomach cancers and skin cancers. And they said to me, please be our messenger. Please take our story back to your country about what your country is doing to our people and our land. And so I decided to become a journalist. And from there, I ended up going to the Burma Thai border and working with women refugees who were fleeing the ethnic cleansing. And uh, they were enduring horrific of course, um, mass rape by the dictatorship, which continues sadly to this day. 
and but they were organizing and they had brilliant visions and they were they knew what they needed to do and when i would put the microphone in you know and ask them what their visions were it was like a light came and they knew exactly the messages that they had but it was really heavy and so i remember the vision of world pulse came to me one night when I was uh, sleeping on a bamboo mat under the stars. It was a really hot, it was a sticky night. I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning because of um, just, I felt really depressed. I, I, I knew that I could take these stories as a journalist and, and we could publish them, but, but who, was, who was really going to listen? Who was really going to care? And I knew that what I had heard in these stories was, was um, the solution for the world. And so as I was turning and I was in the sleeping and waking um, moment, I was looking up at the stars and like kind of like when a lightning bolt strikes you, that's what happened to me. But the stars pulsed at me and I saw this blue light pulsed. And I realized that what I was seeing was the 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 light of an unlocking voice of a woman and that when that light pulsed it set off a chain reaction and activated other voices also to to rise and to be unlocked and it created this beautiful blue light in the shape of a globe and i just stared at it and i knew that i was being shown a way forward and that it wasn't just about voice but it was about connected voice and I knew, I said to myself at that moment, I'm, I'm not going to, I can no longer be a messenger for these phenomenal leaders. I, the world needs a communication source where they can speak for themselves in their own words, be their own messengers, and, um, and perhaps even more importantly, connect to each other, not feel so alone. So that, that was um, the, the original vision of World Pulse, but of course, I was um, you know, very shy, but I went back to the United States and became a social entrepreneur, a rather obsessed social entrepreneur for how to build this vision without any idea of how to do it. And um, you know, this, it's kind of still gives me chills today, but this is an image of a day in the life, the real life connections that are happening in any given hour on World Pulse across the world. And it's, uh, you know, it reminds me of the blue light of, of that day. And World Pulse is a place where any of you can come. We've had to learn how to design it to be a place where there's no cyber harassment, there's no cyber attacking or trolling, it's heavily protected and a culture of deep, deep feminine support has had a chance, has had a chance to blossom there. And uh, the stories are being exchanged, the resources are being exchanged, and women are going on to launch incredible, build incredible movements, launch incredible businesses, etc. One of the stories I'll share is about Samira. And Samira came to World Pulse. She, she told us that she had decided to end her own life. And she had been cyber blackmailed by a man in India. She had a fundamentalist family. And this man had taken advantage of her and was threatening to share her um, information about it to her family. And she knew that if her family were to find out about it, that they would kill her. So she was in a very difficult place and she had told herself this was the day that she was gonna end her life. And she tells us she was sitting on a park bench and just kind of aimlessly scrolling through her phone very numbly and she stumbled upon World Pulse and she just clicked it. She started exploring the rooms, the stories and suddenly this washed over her she wasn't the only person that this was happening to, that others were going through similar situations. And, and um, she just decided that moment, wow, I'm, that she was gonna live. And she made connections with people who um, gave her legal advice as, as well, who 
gift, um, really gave her moral and emotional support. And uh, today, she just wrote us a few months ago that she's launched a legal clinic for young girls who are survivors of cyber violence and cyber harassment that's serving over, over 100 girls in our community. And so Samira and Beatrice are just one of the few, uh, many, many, many thousands of examples of the ripple effects out in the world. And uh, there it actually is a, a, a digital empowerment framework that World Pulse has used that we've listened deeply through women to evolve on what is needed. And it falls into these categories of, you know, having a safe place to speak no one speaks for you, you speak for yourself, that you have a community of solidarity with a click of a button, you can truly support women around the world with your comments, with your connections, that um, you can also trade resources, scholarships, fellowships, opportunities, what share your skills, etc. And then the digital trainings, because uh, globally, Half of the world's women are offline, sadly, still, and really cut off from that type of power and opportunity. And our members who have some access to the computers and technology, even if a little, really want to bring that back to their communities. And so uh, we have digital ambassador and digital change maker training programs, and those have really flourished to train tens of thousands more. And we learned, you know, something really different than what I think we were launching World Pulse at the same time as the, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world and where his platforms were really going for, for growth and for profit and for clicks and for eyeballs. World Pulse is designed for impact, for voice, for leadership. And so this, we designed a, a leadership pathway where um, you can begin to speak but earn leadership badges and have an ecosystem of support on World Pulse and grow, grow your impact. We've even launched impact dashboards where those that have their visions, their dreams can put it on the record, they can narrate it, they can see their progress a little bit like a Fitbit and um, author their own impact instead of somebody else telling them, well, go ahead and distribute these solar cook stoves. They're deciding this is what I want to do. I want to eradicate violence. I want to bring deaf girls um, digital skills. Um, and we've seen members like Nema Namadamu, who grew up with polio, uh, was born with polio in one of the worst places in the world to be a woman. And Nema uh, basically started speaking on World Pulse about her dream to connect the women of the DRC. And she started Women Only Cyber Centers that are grown across the DRC and there are hundreds of thousands of women, or sorry, hundreds, thousands of women who are uh, growing their leadership and impacting hundreds of thousands more, starting campaigns to the White House, um, activating, uh, special envoys from the White House to their country and uh, truly are, sh are, sh are doing a paradigm shift in the region, authoring their own narratives and futures for the country. So I'll just I'll say my last words here, which is thank you so much, Anne. Um, their World Pulse is our dream is to digitally connect half a million who go on to impact a billion. Our impact tracking has shown us that um, for after one to two years for every woman that's active on World Pulse, she goes on to impact 2,000 more on average. So if you link 500,000, we're gonna get to a billion and really creating a tipping point to gender justice and equality. We can do it quite fast. So I invite um, all of you, of course, or those that you know who have a story to tell that is burning inside of them, come to World Pulse or be an encourager and support others. Um, and truly, truly, we do have the power to take our cell phones and shift them from devices of distraction to shift ourselves from being victims of technology or using that kind of mindset and language to owning our power, to claiming the power of technology to be these purposeful portals of change. So let's, let's reclaim, let's log on, let's rise up and uh, really inviting all of you as well to um, plug in and to the World Pulse Network. All right. 
I pass the baton. Thank you so much, Encina. Um, can you? There you go. Good, good. I am so grateful that both you and um, Sandra included your personal stories. And what was so evident is that you listened so carefully. And that resulted in creating new solutions to old problems. And that's exactly what our world needs right now. And the impact that you are making and the and how it's reverberating these stories of women going out and like you said impacting more lives uh it's um it's immeasurable even though your numbers and your impact are tremendous imagine just imagine if we could count it all and thank you very very much um and um so now it's my honor to bring back uh shauna and shauna um it, and now we get to hear from you. And speaking of listening carefully, would you um, share the importance of listening and supporting original nations power and honoring the indigenous wisdoms and science? Um, yeah, thank you so much. We're excited to hear from you. Thank you. It's been very good to listen to Yensina and Sakura and um, I just see a lot of parallels um, in all the work that we're doing, even though the work, you know, is out there in the world in different ways. It's so beautiful to see you really answering the call that you know is guiding you, and that's certainly been the case for me as well in the work that I do. And I, I do want to speak to indigenous knowledge and wisdom, and and how that can be really a framework and a guiding point for so many of us right now. I think just you know so much has been spinning with the chaos and in, in confusion in the world and so much um, heartache and heartbreak for so many people. I think that's really also part of the media narrative that's out there. And so I see it's very important what Yantina just said, how can we start to really claim this for ourselves as something that can go out in the world in a healing way, in a way that can be something that's positive and helping us all be empowered together, um, really uplifting voices all over the world. And I see that's something that's happening slowly but in a really beautiful way. Um, something that my dad and I speak to is the domination code. And my dad's work of 40 years, he has a book called um, Pagans in the Promised Land, Decoding the Doctrine of Christian Discovery. And his film is um, The Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code. And so I feel very grateful to have joined him in the work that he's been doing for 40 years. And I see that my own story has been um, one of really deep spiritual nourishment in many ways from indigenous elders in my community, from my Shawnee Lenape background. Um, I didn't necessarily grow up with Shawnee Lenape elders in my family, but I had incredible elders from other nations guiding me and holding me in ceremony and space of that way. But I also had a lot of trauma and abuse and domestic violence and assaults and these kinds of things. So I relate to the stories that many of you have shared. And I wanted to see for myself and understanding the work that my dad was doing, where did this domination code begin and how far back did it go? And, you know, was the world always like this? So I really see that right now, more that we can see that there's a different origin story, that there's something pre-civilization, that there's something way, way far back in what I call the time that was before, which comes to me through messages and dreams and really seeing what I also speak to of the reverence code. And that goes back to these teachings of our original peoples. And I don't just see the original peoples as Turtle Island or what's here now known as the United States, but it's all over the planet and how beautiful to see original nations in Africa and original nations in India and original nations in Asia, and all over the globe, we can see this, um, there are certain key um, understandings and original instructions that all of these peoples hold, which is that connection to the land and that connection to honoring women as sacred life givers. And I think just even saying that as a focal point to honor women in that way, just by saying the word sacred life giver has a completely different way of understanding what it means to be a woman. And just going back into understanding and my research and understanding of, of women and even those that you shared with your stories going to work in indigenous um, communities, you know, just really honoring 
the clan mothers and the matrilineal line that has been a focus in the past. That shifted over time and it became more patriarchal. Um, so that's what we've been seeing. But it's this rebalancing with the great shift that's happening where we're seeing this rise in our feminine power where women are really stepping into our power. And I love that men are also coming into their hearts even more and it's very beautiful to see this rebalancing that's so needed now. So I see this is part of it. This is part of what the original peoples have always known for a time of memorial. Um, and this great awakening that's happening is helping us to shift and balance and harmony to bring this back for healing and transformation for all peoples and for the planet itself and for all beings. Um, I just wanna speak as well to some of those values of empathy, compassion, honor, respect, love. These are simple teachings and yet so foundational to our original nation's instructions and what we know and carry in our hearts and the ways that we live to really uphold that balance. Um, I also just wanna say that I speak to the time that was before, um, as I mentioned, and I have a lot of messages that come to me that I share. So I'll share one at the end, but just I'll say a little bit of, of a message here that kind of brings it into perspective a little bit more. There was a time not too long ago when nature was sacred and our people lived with the land, a time of peace, balance, and harmony, a time of great beauty and wonder and magnificent surroundings. Our people followed the laws of the universe and nature and lived with great reverence for the earth, mother nature, and living things. Our people were one with the earth and felt connected with the animals, the trees, and the plants. Our people did could hear nature because it was not so removed from them as it is now. It was part of them. Our people listened to the wind and smelled the air for changes. They were also more in tune with their inner voice and trusted it. They knew about things that we've since forgotten and have been taken away from us. They had a knowing about things to come or the happenings of the day. They had a deep understanding of the healing nature of the earth and plant medicines. They listened to the nature spirits who could speak with the ancestors spirit helpers and guides for direction. This is not so very strange that it may seem today for the spirit realm is right among us. There was a time before patriarchy and organized religion and fear-based society. We've lost sight of this old harmonious way of life with city lights, so many distractions and greed for material things. These new ways were placed here and forced upon us and they've made us forget the importance of the original instructions. But by following the original instructions, we lived simply and abundantly. We lived in tune with the spirit and gave thanks for the magnificent beauty and all of life in our world. Our, our eyes were still sharp and good and our hearts still pure. Let us remember the sacred way of life in our daily work. Let us remember our connection to the great web of life and all its beauty. We are all connected in these sacred elements. We are connected to the trees and they are a part of us. We're connected to the plants, they offer us medicine. We are connected to the four directions and our beautiful mother earth and all her magnificence. We're connected to all of the waters. It makes up a large part of our bodies. We're connected to the animals. They are our family and provide us food. We're connected to the air. We're dependent upon it for our very survival. We're connected to the great cosmos and the great mystery and the great spirit of the life and the land. And most of all, we're connected to each other. We're all brothers and sisters in this human family each of us beautiful and unique, and we are all related. So I just wanna say thank you for this, and um, I just hold this blessing and prayer and vision of all of us returning to this reverence for this time and this life. Wanishi, thank you. Oh my goodness, what an honor and a privilege to be here today and to, Listen to all of your heart songs, um, the magnificent, phenomenal work that you all are doing on behalf of women and girls in our world, our ohana, our family is just incredible. We applaud you all. And at this time, we're gonna bring the three of you phenomenal women onto the screen. So it'll be Sandra, Shauna, and Yasina. And uh, for our very last question, and uh, which kind of seems, you know, a little bit redundant now with all that you've shared, 
but we want to focus on how can we as women in the audience be able to you know do our part what can we do to help promote healthy accessible and positive impact for women and girls locally and globally Who wants to start? <laughs> um, I, 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 Shauna, Yensina, who wants to begin? <laughs> okay, you guys, I'm gonna keep talking because we don't want, you know, yeah. quiet time here. Uh, mm -hmm. I just wanna thank both of you. I think you're amazing women. I'm so glad to connect with you both. Um, Shauna, I feel that you gave us the vision just now. It was so beautiful and sacred and so aligned with my own personal practice. I just, you just articulated it so beautifully and thank you for that. And Yensina, the work you're doing is this connecting, you know, I I'm just love the way, I, I think of this paradigm of othering and belonging and you're allowing all women to belong. You're offering this platform, this place for women to be safe and to belong if we say we do. That's something I've learned. I never belonged anywhere until I lived in the remote parts of the world. Then I felt that I belonged. And so, but what one thing I've learned is I belong if I say I do, and if I want to feel like I belong, then do some service, be supportive, give it away, uplift others. That makes me feel like I belong. So I think that's part of the answer to the question. And, and I'll say another little piece of, around media and the power of media. If you have small children, talk to them about what they're seeing. I will say, you know, in doing the research for the film Brainwashed, Sex Camera Power, I came across a study that it analyzed 16 animated princess movies, very famous ones, shall remain nameless. They all perpetuated rape culture. Now, these are things that children starting at two start consuming. And I was talking to, to someone about it and she said, um, I, you know, I watched these movies with my, my daughter who's a toddler. I said, that's okay, you can watch, but you've got to start talking to your daughter and your son about what they're seeing. Power, domination, and control are elements of rape culture. We're so used to it, we don't even notice. And so these are things that you know, it's part of the lens. It's like the attentiveness and the awareness. What See what we're really seeing and name it. And I'd I, I say that's another thing we can do. Name it in the moment. Whether we're in uncomfortable meetings, believe me, I'm in them all the time. And if there is abuse of, of power going on, name it in the moment, call it out. It, you know, you can do it in a way that doesn't blame shame or anything. You just have, we have to name things. So that, that's the beginning. And also unlock your own voice. You know, everybody has, and I think Shauna brought this out in her talk. We are these unique sparks. Everyone on the planet is valuable with a uniqueness that we all need. So find your way. You know, we don't all do it in the same way, but find your calling. I always, I did a whole TED talk, which I can share. It's a TED women talk on um, if you don't know what your purpose is, find your heartbreak. What is it that breaks your heart in this life? And when you find that, it may be the very beginning of you finding your purpose. So now I'll turn it over <laughs> to anybody else who wants to share. I can go. I, yes, yes, and yes. And <laughs> I think one of the things that all three of us have done today that I think is so important, one is 
is continue to speak your vision and speak it out loud and across many mediums and encourage others to speak their vision. Right now we're living at a time where, especially if you're barraged by the media cycles, you we, we contract and we're starting to be steeped in, in the despair. And so by showing alternate ways and Shauna and Sandra, you both did this so beautifully in your talks of even if it's go back to what came before with the original people, but, but be communicating that vision and making our own knowledge and being our own creators of content is really important because the world needs to see something else that is possible and real. So that's one. And then the second one, I would say, I would just draw our attentiveness to the online world as an incredible seat of power right now. And the sad truth is, is that it's a war zone for women and girls, anyone who's different and, and transgender and non-binary and, you know, but it is a place where studies are coming in and over half of adolescent girls globally are saying that they've experienced cyber violence and cyber harassment. And it's just uncalculable. You can, cannot even calculate the cost of not only those that have experienced that trauma, which is re as real as in the physical world, but also the, the suppression and the silencing that this casts on these emerging voices. The women who choose not to run for office, choose not to share their opinions and um, step back from certain kinds of prof professions. It's, it's creating this huge suppressive effect. So I think one thing we can do that is actually really fun and beautiful is when we are in the online world is lift up other voices, lift up other women just with comments. And we do this all the time in World Pulse. I've learned how profound it is. I even started World Pulse. And if somebody leaves a comment on my post, I'm like, wow, they, gosh, they really care what they have to say. So if you're on a Facebook or an Instagram or you're in a Zoom call like this, like you all have been doing to each other, you know, um, when someone's brave enough to speak, thank them for that, lift them up, you know, really shine mirror back to them. And you're going to create this unstoppable cascade of goodness and healing online. And we can do that. Beautiful. I admire and love everything that all of you, both of you are sharing. Um, I completely agree with you, Sandra, naming it, I think is a big part of the shift where the silencing that you just mentioned, Tina, like that's been part of the culture with this domination code that I've spoken about and the dom domination dehumanization, like in families, it's like, oh, we don't talk about that. Oh, we keep it hidden away. Let's keep it in the closet. We don't air our dirty laundry to the neighbors, but it's like, okay, that witnessing, you know, the compassionate witnessing for others. And also I think that's part of it. I think seeing the shadow, I've been saying in a lot of my talks, the shadow is coming to light in order to be seen and witnessed and healed. Um, mm -hmm. It can no longer be in the closet, like incredible to see the Me Too movement and all that's shifted just with that. Like, <laughs> it's so beautiful. And how much more, as you mentioned, Yantina, like what's next and mm -hmm. just building and building. And I think so much of it is also really empowering each other. I think another part of it though, that I see is very important is really understanding our own inner dialogue and how that domination code dehumanization has become what people internally feed themselves, especially women and girls. And that's definitely, I see part of the media and, and all of the narrative and everything that's bombarding us all of the time to think that we're less than, not enough, comparison. So then that starts to create this sisterhood wound where I see, you know, like women that are competing, women that are trolling, women that are <laughs> jealous. But I saw this incredible film, if you haven't watched it yet, I think it's called Violet. Uh, Justine Bateman had just put it out, I believe, and I think it has Olivia Munn in it. I don't know if I said her name right, but she's beautiful. I think it's the most incredible genius uh, film. It's something that I've been speaking a lot about, but just that inner dialogue and how women are in that space of just having this negative self-talk, negative self-talk spinning and spinning, and that's silencing us. That's keeping us 
restricted and restrained and not sharing. So the more that we can help each other to see each other, to help shine and say, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I wanna hear you, I wanna see you. Um, I feel your power, I feel your strength. These are all so important. And I, I think as well, like you mentioned, um, speaking to the children and, and naming what's happening, naming how these shifts are, you know, really changing the world and, and what's to come in a, in a really beautiful way, and shifting that awareness from the domination to the reverence, I think is a big part of what we're working through right now. So powerful. We, we still have 15 more minutes. So if there's anything else on your hearts that you would love to share, please do. Go ahead, Sandra, start us off. Well, they both inspire me so much. I, you know, I feel like this is just, just, I, it feels so good to be here, let me just say. And I loved what you both shared. Um, for me, um, the healing is because, you know, is within. That is where it starts. And this object, objectification of women has, we have internalized from the time we were little kids. That's what's been reflected to us. We've taken it inside and we believed it. And so I think that's where that negative voice comes from. Yeah. So the idea of attentiveness and mindfulness and noticing what is going on inside and, you know, one thing I've noticed is if I start having a flurry, like this shoot of negative self-talk to ask, who am I angry with? Because anger was not okay for girls and women. And so as a kid growing up, it went inward. That's, and so that was like an unlocking, oh, and then giving myself permission to share it with a safe person, to name it and to talk about it and not keep it secret and hidden away. Because, you know, going into our minds can be, it's like going into a dangerous neighborhood. Don't go there alone. Like, breeze, <laughs> talk to somebody else who you trust. And that's where the healing is. And so this idea of really um, noticing and naming what's happening inside and like in Sina's whole platform is this idea of safe space and connecting of women and a place to give voice to the unspeakable, which actually, if given an opportunity in a safe place, is speakable. It is a complete paradigm shift. What you've done, Yancina, is so powerful. And so what happens when all of a sudden I realize I'm not the only one who feels this way and there are other people who have acquired some wisdom, some experience, strength, and hope that they can share with me about how to move forward. Oh, that makes me cry. You know, it's just like, because the, this objectification keeps us fragmented and isolated and disempowered. That's what it does. So finding ways to heal it, both within and in our relationships around us and to create, create safe communities is really powerful. Um, you know, we're all, we all create, we're all these sparks of soul. We're all soul. We all are these souls in these bodies. And this is for me, it's an incarnation. Okay. I'm a woman this time. Ooh, I'm Brazilian American, whatever, whatever, you know, it's like, we all have these kind of the the flavor of the lifetime. Okay, so I have this one this time. And, you know, to realize that there actually is value. I mean, imagine being cast in the role of villain in this life. I won't name names, but you can all imagine because we've had some villains on the world stage recently. And imagine having to play that role out in an incarnation. You know, I think we're all here cast in a role, but it's our job to evolve. So we find a way to evolve for the soul to learn and to grow until we reclaim our original identity of perfection, you know, and, and that's the soul as a reflection of, you know, whatever you call, you know, spirit, God, um, divine mother, whatever, whatever you call it. Okay. But Tom passed. Who wants to go next? 
Well, I was, I was just going to build on that piece around you're, you're talking about going beyond the, the separation into the, the solidarity and the, yeah, I can't, un, can't underestimate the power of um, going, really connecting it with the women and the people behind the headlines of what we're reading in the news and the media today. And, um, you know, there's a tendency to feel quite numb and, and to turn away, but the, we're living in this world of these nation states, this manufactured s structure of separation. And like, we just have to focus on the US and just the US now and forget the rest of the world or whatever country you're in, right? But when you're talking to a woman um, in Yemen, or uh, in you know living under Bolsonaro in Brazil, and I mean any any country of the world, anywhere you're reading a headline, it's phenomenal the 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 the, the depth of universality that you can feel, and that news story never looks the same to you again, and it shapes the actions that you take in your day to day life, and it also fills your cup. I mean, a lot of people say to me, "How do you?" how do you how do you live with all the violence and the heartbreak and the devastation around the world that you're reading about even in our own country in the, U the U.S. where I'm from and and I just I cry a lot I cry a lot but I also feel really alive and really connected and those women have given me my voice They've been there for me when my partner died of a heart attack. Um, when you know I was having dark days, I didn't think I could go on with this this vision. And women from the heart of the Democratic Republic of Congo were like, "Yes, you can do it. You keep going. You know, we're here for you." Even though they were enduring also ethnic cleansing and mass rape in their community. So, what the strength we're going to get when we reach out instead of turn away? is phenomenal and then one last thing since you're in movies sandra i've always i've started having this vision of a really amazing movie entertainment um that takes you know the all of the authoritarian dictatorships honestly we're rolling back into authoritarianism massively big time you know 80 countries have moved away from being democratic in the last year they've been becoming more authoritarian and under dictatorships. And it feels kind of hopeless, but I'd love to see a brilliant, smart movie of women's movement building that really overtakes and overthrows every single dictatorship in the entire world. Because we actually have that power to do that. <laughs> we're just told that we're separate and we're weak and we can't do it. But if we actually were to connect and we brought the brightest minds and the brightest you know, spies and, you know, assassins and life givers and, you know, everything to the table would be an incredible story. And Cena, let's do it. Yeah, let's, <laughs> it's the movie I want to watch. Okay, <laughs> I love it. Um, um, I, I love what you both share. It's, it's just very inspiring to sit here with you both. Um, I, I also see very much that separation, you know, like the domination code. And I see that really, I've been speaking to this, you know, really, if we had a taproot, that's what I see more and more. It's like, that's really the taproot of so much that has happened. And we're seeing all these symptoms playing out in the world right now. Um, I see a shift as well, though, that the more that we can speak to that and really see it and name it, because it's really hidden in plain sight and seen as normal. And it's very interesting that if we can really shift our lens and start to say, this isn't normal, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't feel good. <laughs> um, I think that's part of it. And I, I really see that um, what you're saying as well um, about, uh, my mind is kind of going into a blank because I'm just like overwhelmed with both of you and all that you're doing here. But um, I just see like so much in terms of being able to really uh, come into a place of sisterhood, I think is like the bigger part of, of what I really vision. And, and what does that mean? What does that look like? I know that when I sit in circle with women, just like we are now, there's this really empowering, beautiful 
um, synergy that starts to happen and we start to feed off each other and we nurture each other and we, <laughs> we build, as you say, a build onto that and build onto that and we're inspired and we have ideas. <laughs> I think there's really incredible innovative ideas and genius sparks all over and this conversation and so much more out there. I hope that the people that are watching and tuning in now or later will continue to be inspired for all the stories and all of the incredible visions that we have to really offer in the world is healing right now. So I just feel really good about it. Thank you. Thank you all. We're getting towards the end of our formal gathering formal circle and then we're going to go into our after party uh, and which will still be in circle but it'll be open for however we want it to move and for our audience to join us so um, Shauna I know you're going to give us the closing blessing and I just okay. wanted to say, I wanted to just say that being in a circle I call myself a circle evangelist part of the million circle that it is how we transform that whole oppression, that whole domination into being equal with all of nature. <laughs> but I think I'm equal with the trees. You know, I don't worry about my wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you all. It's been brilliant. It's been wonderful. It's been so hopeful. And Shauna, will you close us out? And then Sandy is going to... Uh, segue us in ending this and moving into the other. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of um, spiritual messages that come to me and I just wanted to close with, I feel like another kind of a vision and prayer for what one of the messages that came to me has said. And I think it's been inspiring for many people, but it's just a partial message. So here it is. Now once more, people come to this new way of being with lightness in their heart and a sense of renewal. This is when things truly begin to shift. This is when more and more people begin to feel there is something happening and the messages begin to spread and more people will begin to wake up to what they felt was missing before. They will let go of past angers, hatreds, hurts and sorrows and begin anew. This is a time of renewal and to celebrate that there is indeed a shift. This is a time of coming together and support and community and people begin to see the error in their hearts. This is a truly powerful time. Next, we see that people find it less and less appealing to be in a world with chaos or violence or fighting, and their hearts really open up in a new way. This is when things start to shift on a large scale, and people come together to make big changes. This is a time, of, there, is a, there is no tolerance for hate, bigotry, slattering, hunting for sport racism and all the isms and ignorant choices that come from fear in the world. Suddenly there's a new ideal for coming together and it's not about fighting the separateness. This is a new time of deep acceptance for differences and a realization of oneness on a bigger scale. So I just hold this prayer and vision for the healing and reunion of the sacred feminine and sacred masculine as I mentioned at the beginning. And I do see it happening slowly um, more and more as we're to see that beauty of women really stepping into our power and men coming to their hearts. So just thank you for all of that you're doing to hold this vision. Just a lot of love and blessings and healing to all of our relations out there. Lamishi, thank you. Thank you so much, Shauna. Thank you to all of you. Let me um, find a way <laughs> to not just bring today's call um, to a uh, to an to an end and move into our after party. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to remove the spotlight from you, <laughs> Shauna. I think we're all in gallery view now. I hope. Um, but to also close out this series, um, I should tell you all that I've been taking copious notes and I think I have 12 of the of your ideas and, and wisdom on what we all can do that moved me to tears. 
and um, and also inspired me greatly. So I thank you, and I'm beyond grateful. Anything that you mentioned that you would like to go out to the network, please do send it to me as soon as possible, and I'll rush it out to everyone in an email. I will link that to the YouTube video of this because we want this message to go far and wide. We want this message to be heard by all ears because yes, Shauna, it is time for a new way. It is time to drop our assumptions of the way things used to be and re-examine. And we have this time of the solstice to do that, don't we? Um, and, um, and it's time for a new story and you're all extraordinary storytellers and vehicles for that story, um, for women and also for men. And we can talk about that in our after party. So, um, again, everybody will get a, a copy of this call and recording. And then just to let you know that our sacred circle for the soul gatherings, which I mentioned earlier, we're going to be addressing the 12 issues in our uh, monthly calls and our next one in January on the 19th is women in power and decision making um, um, from our traditions. Uh, how do the women of our past inspire us into living into our divine assignment? And that's an example of how we're going to be taking every one of our topics into the heart in an informal circle meeting platform way um, in our typical Sarah fashion with women in circle. So thank you all for being in this square circle here with us. Um, and um, now I'm going to uh, and, and lead us into our little chant. Now you all are, those of you in the audience cannot hear us. I'm inviting us here on the call to unmute yourself. And we say three times, women uniting the world. So for the last time at the General Congress of Women, let's say it loud and proud, women uniting the world. Women, women uniting, uniting the world. Women, the world. women, women uniting, uniting the world. And women, women uniting the world. The world. <laughs> and so it is. All right. Well, let's bring in, I'm going to be inviting you all to join us in the circle. Now we get to hear your voice. Um, I do believe you have to accept that. I've actually never been on this side of being brought into a call. So here you come. Thank those of you who have who have hung out with us. Um, here you come. And forgive me if I'm inviting you more than once. I just said don't I'm not clear if you haven't accepted or you choose not to accept. So you might get invited a couple times. I'd rather be safe than sorry. But perhaps I can, um, I just wanna say while we're waiting for everyone to kind of stream in here, there, you, the, the work on elevating the voices of women, you know, um, can, is, cannot be understated. And, um, and I love, you know, the idea of lifting up the voices of women on social media as best we can, uh, wherever we go, as well as in the room, in the moment. I heard that as well. Um, and, you know, also, perhaps I'd like to get your feedback on the importance of the men, because the men, I'm seeing a lot of men coming into circle right now. We have a very good friend of Sarah uh, Clay Boykin, Circles of Men Project. And he, he's identified this new male archetype as the new compassionate male. So perhaps we can also focus on that. Maybe there's a movie there. <laughs> so I'm just going to um, now open this up for anyone who would like to add to that. And that can be the, the three of our speakers as well. I can just kick us off to say that when World Pulse first started, we had community circles that were setting community guidelines. And it was the first, one of the first questions was, should World Pulse be accessible to men? Do we welcome men into this community? And it was, you know, back and forth, lots of discussion, really a global conversation. And the answer really resoundingly was yes, absolutely. That transformation will come through dialogue that men need to, there's a reconciliation, a gender reconciliation that's needed and men need to really deeply listen and cry and feel 
um, for this, for the world to heal. So let's invite men, but let's still be the, the in charge <laughs> of, the, of the culture and the, the, um, the policies here at World Pulse. We want to be able to have people be blocked, men or women, if they're violating policies and respect. Um, but but really it was really seen as the way forward and so today they're about 10 percent incredible men part of the world pulse community who are reporting amazing impact stories who are doing initiatives as women's rights activists around the world and they have been feeling alone too so um it helps to have space for men it's just the, the there's a role of step back and listen for for a while and really feel Thank you for that, Yancina. That that's really insightful, and it reminded me as I was listening that in the course of doing the research for our movie Brainwashed: Sex Camera Power, um, I started putting together a resources <laughs> section, and that is I invite anybody who wants to to go to brainwashedmovie.com and look in the resources section. There's a ton of research, there are articles, uh, there are tools to maintain gender balance and different things. But one of the articles I came across was about the impact of rape culture on men. The fact that we've all been brainwashed since birth that, uh, into these distinct roles and the incredible abuse of boys from very early childhood, you know, this cutting off uh, from the feelings, the, you know, kind of acceptable ways to be that didn't really allow them to be who they fully were either. Um, so I, I think it's important to be mindful that in a sick society, and I'm talking about global society, um, we've all been affected. You know, it, we've all been brainwashed to think that this is how it is. And so as women redesign our ways of moving through life, breaking out of traditional roles, and some of us very early in life, that you know we need to also find ways to help men. And I, I love the way Shauna says, help men move into their hearts. And, mm -hmm. and, and I love what you said, Yancina, about this need for deep listening on their part and nobody breaks out of these old paradigms on a dime. This is the process. And it's not always comfortable. So I, I think, Sandy, you know, I, I think it's very brave to raise the question you did. You know, what is, you know, do men play a part in this and how? Um, so just wanted to honor the question and your answers. Well, thank you so much for saying that, Sandra, because we're, we don't want to leave our boys behind. If they're, you know, perpetrator, generally speaking, I mean, culturally for since, and if you see Shauna and her father's film, it'll all make sense. Um, the, that, that we, it can, it's generational. So how do we impact not just the men, but the boys as well? And I love the comment about paying attention to, I mean, when you're sitting with your children, Sandra, you know, watching and, and, you know, watching cartoons and finding and paying attention, being attentive to those moments where you, you call it out and you say, see that that's not, you know, appropriate. And then hopefully you will replace this all with content where, you know, we'll, we'll evolve out of media that promotes that sort of culture. I want to just in response to that, Sandy, has anybody here, I don't know if you have little children at home, but have you seen uh, the animated Disney series called Doc McStuffins? So I worked on that series for the first three years. And in the story, there's a little girl, she's African American, who plays Doc, she opens a little clinic for her toys, and she's a doctor. Her mom's a real doctor, right? Um, and so you know, this, this whole series is about, you know, this little girl who's the doctor and there, and it, the whole, the intention behind the series was to depict ways for little kids to live 
you know, it, healthy lives, to lose their fear of the doctor, but to live healthy lives so they don't have to go. And one um, little boy was overheard asking his mom, mommy, can boys be doctors too? Yeah. Yeah. Can boys be doctors too? And this is what happens when we start shifting narratives. You know, it, it, <laughs> so that generation's growing up you know, with a whole new inspiration. And while I'm on this story, um, an African-American woman doctor saw the series and she put out a blog post on social media saying, I am Doc McStuffins. She said, when I was growing up, I knew I wanted to be a doctor and everybody told me it couldn't be. And so what happened? All these other African-American women doctors found her blog post and they started writing they ended up forming a new medical society called the Artemis Medical Society, subtitle, We Are Doc McStuffins. <laughs> and when they launched their event, they brought Chris Nee, the show creator, to do the keynote. So this is what happens when we start changing narratives and portrayals. Yeah, there's a, um, the importance of role models cannot be underestimated. And the importance, and I just wanted to say the importance of also having the internet as a tool for empowerment and connection. And at the Fourth World Women's Conference in 1995 in Beijing, it said, women learn the internet. Women get this tool or you'll be way behind. And so, uh, Yancina, you have done that and you've made it so that it's a safe place and a place of connection. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is there's such similarities of being able to overcome the sexism as it is with the racism. And we need to have everybody in that conversation. We as white needs to be in that conversation where we hear other perspectives and voices and heal that. And so it's, again, when we're in a safe, sacred space and we truly listen to one another, our pain, and when we have fallen astray or something, to be called into that circle to learn and to be accepted because we've all have been trained in a way of separation and the ranking of diversity, which of course nature never does, so. And those of you in the audience who are not, um, who chose not to join us, if there's any questions or any comments, you can always chat them and we'll, re we'll say them for you. Okay. I hear uh, many of the comments that have been made and I just, it, it brings me back every time, like, okay, the taproot of that, the taproot of like this work around racism and racial justice and how do we go into inclusion and how do we look at these stories? Um, again, it's like, okay, domination, dehumanization is at the root of that. So I think that's really what I, my course, the reverence code, um, change makers course is what people ended up calling it, is, um, you know, I just really see it's walking people through these understandings to really see the world as this upside down place in the narrative that we've been spinning in. We're swimming in the waters <laughs> of all of that. And, and we're trying to find our way and we're taught to really judge each other or taught to be in competition, domination, dehumanization over. And I see, you know, this is really the shifting. My dad and I speak to the dome that's on many of the state buildings or the or the churches and these things, it's the domination over, domo over. Um, that's something that my dad teaches more about in terms of the languaging and really getting into the heart of all of that. But when we flip it over, it becomes the sacred vessel, the sacred feminine, and that becomes the offering, the holding of that matrilineal energies as we've been speaking to. I just really think that that's a really big shift and really seeing each other, hearing each other, honoring each other, blessing each other for the unique people that each person is. And so I think that's part of this shift that I hear in, in each of the things that you're saying, I just kind of always bring it back to those contrasts. 
Oh my goodness. I am just sitting here thinking this was the most perfect topic to conclude 2021 with. And just seeing all you beautiful inside and out, strong, divine women leaders, um, it gives me hope. <laughs> it really does give us hope. And for our younger generation who will become the leaders of tomorrow and beyond, uh, to have wonderful role models such as yourselves um, speak and breathe life into them. And I will never now watch Disney animated movies or any other movies without thinking about this conversation and the seeds that it has planted into my heart, into my mind. And I hope that uh, we're able to share this recording far and wide because I feel like these young girls and women need to see this and integrate it into their daily lives as well and continue to ripple it forward. Um, I love how you've shared pictures and stories of women, indigenous communities, where you've gone back to to do your work. I can't, you know, you, you think that they're not as connected, but oh my goodness, everyone has a cell phone and a smartphone and that's how they access the world. And with these inventions, uh, they are so connected. It's like this beautiful inner web of life and their strength, their power, their stories, their passion continues to elevate each other. And that's what we're here to do is continuously provide opportunities for our sisters to stand on our shoulders and, and embrace each other and uh, elevate one another. This is, this is it. We're in this paradigm shift, this global spiritual awakening and um, just hearing all of you today just continuously reaffirms all of that. And so thank you so very much. You know, can I, I just want to come back to something you said, Sandra, and I, you know, I, it was a little, thank you, Larissa, that was lovely. Um, regarding, you know, this courage, it's just like, no, that was, it didn't feel like courageous to me. It didn't feel courageous to ask that question. Um, it, and perhaps it just comes easier to me, but I think that's what this this time calls for, for us to be courageous to listen to our voices that you've inspired us. How, how do we just stop and pause in the moment and go, okay, this is a moment to call it out. Oh, wait, you know, how do we trust ourselves? That's hard for women to do to trust ourselves, right? I am so impressed by the fact that the women in Uganda, oh, I'm sorry, where, where was the woman who lost her brother? Um, Uganda, yes. It was Uganda. I, I, here I'm a Western woman with all these resources and accessibility and education. And and here's a woman in Uganda who I don't think has those sa that same access, it, it, or perhaps I'm, it's just my, you know, my limited understanding, but who knew that, who knew to pick up the phone and go, wait, this isn't right. That, that um, uncoiled this assumption of her, reality so ah that this is beyond inspiring it's encouraged me to just pull the veil off rip the band-aid off that i'm trying to protect myself from something i don't know a lot's being revealed to myself in this moment you're all witnessing it and it's recorded well, well but the, i just want to say you know the un world conferences and every year we meet in new york for the commission on the status of women I've been doing this for 40 years. And that's where this platform for action and the 12 issues come from. And it was a worldwide consensus document, of course, that the governments are not honoring it like they should be honoring it, but the women are, and the women know. And the women, every, go, every conference, world conference I have been to, it was like, we have so much more in common than we have to separate us. You know, we all have the same issues. They're just more severe in different areas. But when a woman can, like they did in Uganda, speak out, this is what's happening. And other women become her 
voice. Give her encouragement. We can all be courageous. I can be terribly courageous in a crowd <laughs> or when I know I'm supported. And that's what we're about. So that's, you know, it's also the power of allies, you know, reaching out and building allies so we know we're not alone. But, you know, going back to what you said, Sandy, um, you know, how do we speak out in the moment when we have been programmed to distrust ourselves and our own voices to, because we grew up not seeing what we were really seeing, you know? So I think this is a, a good question. And I think the example that Yensina brought us, you know, a couple of these case studies from the field, these are the kinds of stories we need to share widely because we all identify with them. You know, the, the women we heard in South Africa with this community solution to domestic violence, you know, it was something that was very underground and hidden. And then to have the brilliance of getting a pot or a pan from the kitchen and banging, clanging, everybody could do that. And to name it in the moment, you know, not ignore it anymore and not do it alone, do it as a community, both men and women, you know, banding together. And um, I also want to just share that, you know, uh, let's see, how do I put this? Back um, in, in Brazil, at a pre-internet, when television had 97% reach across the country, not that everybody could afford to have TV, people would pirate um, in the favelas, they pirate electricity, but maybe, but what they had is they put TVs in the public squares. So everybody would gather to watch the soap operas at night. So it was the advent of the soap opera. It, by the way, Brazilian soaps are not like American soaps. So don't, don't go roll your eyes. They're actually really good. <laughs> they're, they're high quality because at the time there was no funding for filmmaking. So all the best talent in Brazil was, you know, serving or acting in these, these soaps. So anyway, um, so what happened, this was a time when the average number of children born to a woman of reproductive age was like seven. That's high. That meant some women were having more than 20 kids, okay? And normally to get a demographic transition, what that means in public health ease is that the average number of kids drops down to what's called replacement level or 2.2 children per woman. Normally for that to happen, it's happened all across history, you know, all throughout history and across, around the world, takes policy change, huge amounts of funding, campaigns, services, yada, yada, yada. What happened in Brazil? There are a lot of studies out there published now. Depiction of women on the soaps having two, one, or no children. That was it. No policy change, no increased funding, no campaigns, no additional services. Simply changing the narrative in Brazil changed population dynamics. And, you know, I learned about this because I was working in reproductive health, family planning, and women's rights and choice. And then I learned, I was like, wait a minute, we just changed the narrative? What? And so I, I think this idea of changing the narrative or changing the story is really powerful and something we shouldn't underestimate. Um, and, you know, I opened a, an office in India in Mumbai to work with Bollywood the way I work with Hollywood and also an office in Lagos, Nigeria to work with Nollywood the way I work with Hollywood. And, you know, there are creative capitals in every country in the world and so if you are, wherever you live, if you want to change the narrative, think about partnering with your own creative community. You know, reach out to writers and producers in your own towns and cities and find a way to inspire them with these very stories we're hearing today of real women with real lives on the ground. That may start to change the narrative. Something that you said in the, from early on um, about hearing other women's stories is very, very, um, I don't know, it's liberating, but it gives us permission. It's a model. 
And uh, when at our very first Sarah meeting, all, 19 and a half years ago, in my living room, not having any idea what there was literally, the internet was just coming about in 2001, really. It was archaic compared to what it is now or even 10 years later. Um, the, the, I, w w there was no clue of anything that looked like us happening in the world. We thought we were a unicorn. Actually, we were kind of a unicorn, women gathering in circle to talk about our different faith traditions. And at our very first meeting, we heard about a, a group that looked like us happening on the seams in Israel and Palestine. Women crossing one another's borders, changing each other's dialects. Um, you know, their, their lives were threatened if they crossed the border you know, into each other's, they, they snuck together to meet in circle. That was our permission. In that moment, we knew we didn't have a choice. We had to meet, we had the privilege, we had this, you know, we had the opportunity, but it was a model for us. So we, I love that you, that, that you brought that up, that, that for me, it inspired me what the word I, where I was, you know, struggling with, you know, I, like I said, I'm in this space right now where I'm like, something is breaking open. It's, you know, to give one another permission and cheer everybody on where they're wild and creative new solutions to old problems so get wild and creative and do that in a place of trust ashana i'm, I'm complete I, you guys just got me on fire here <laughs> um i just want to say as well i'm just you know wanting to speak to the allies and i think that each of us can be allies and and how can we really step into like, oh, how can I be an ally to this person or that person? And I, I, I want to go back to the men and your question originally with that, Sandy, is, you know, we can't do it without the men. And there's so much healing there that we can be there to, to you know, really call out the good instead of vilifying the men and vilifying the patriarchy all the time. Like, how can we say this is part of their conditioning in that domination code? They're swimming in that waters from the time they're little boys, you know, with other men that have also been conditioned for how many generations, how many thousands of years. So part of this deep, deep healing and transformation is really honoring the healing of all of us, including the men. And, and I think that's just so beautiful to say, oh, how can we have these men be our allies in this good work that is so needed right now? We can't do it without them. There's this beautiful, um, I guess it's also the wedding ceremony, like in our, uh, some of our indigenous original nations traditions where we're getting married and, you know, like they, they put the couple in this beautiful Pendleton blanket together. I just always remember hearing the elders saying like, you know, like the, the man has his wing and he's going to fly with his strong wing, but she's going to fly with her strong wing and they have to work together to really make it, you know, together in this beautiful union that they're coming together with so i just hold that vision i think it's really beautiful that we all need each other in this time yes dale this has been awesome i've been looking up all the different things you've mentioned i found the links the websites um so thank you and men um, I love men and I've want, I've known many good ones and some very confused ones and we do need to include them and I'm reminded there was an interview on Fox that I ran across on another site where a woman was tr was trying to talk about the rape issue and the Fox man just kept saying yes women need to have guns and she kept saying no men need to talk about not raping women and the other thing was in the last presidential years we look, we were reminded about locker room talk and it's just boys but there's a lot of good men in those locker rooms and they need to stop the boys how whatever age they are from talking about women the way they do it's i mean if you let men talk disrespectfully about women they're going to act that way and so those are places where men can step up too and sandra TV shows, I'm I'm getting old and I'm at the age where I can look back and see where we did get off track. I now understand why old people talk about the good old days. I'm outraged at the number of TV shows that have sex scenes and naked bodies. And I'm not against naked bodies in their place, but 
there it's egregious it's not necessary it's sort of like if you think if gone with the wind was made now that scene that erotic scene where gable is carrying scarlet up the stairs and we know what's going to happen now we would see all the naked bodies and that wouldn't make the story better and there's another series uh, designated survivor which was a political thriller and in the middle of it i was going to recommend it to my mother but in the middle of it we're seeing sex scenes with men two men and it's like that's fine that they have sex but it was not part of the story so how can we stop it anyway you guys are all you ladies are all great and thank you thank you so much for your inspiration thank you dale um, I'd like to read Peter's comment here. Peter is in our audience. Um, and I hope that's all right, Peter. Chat me back really quick. I went out to all of us, so I hope it's all right. I am going to do it. And if you don't, I'll edit it out, but all good. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I was a little courage there. I was just going to err on the side of honoring what you say. Naga Mehi, oh dear, I hope I said that correctly. This is your, his native language. Shauna, Sandra, and Jensina, thank you for sharing. I have spent most of my working life helping indigenous boys and men here in the Pacific. Most, if not all, are broken and separated from their own stories. Your words inspire me and others who respect and understand the power and dominance of womanhood. It is called Te Where. Ate Tengata, in my language. Moriora, Mor Mor oh dear, please forgive me. Also Shana, I'm going to hope that means thank you. <laughs> in my language, also Shana for your offering of your blessings for today. Our brother Peter is Maori from- um, Oh, Maori, oh, I was- Maori from the Pacific Island ah, of- Maori, ah. Sorry. And so, <laughs> Fofatai Tele Lava, brother from my Samoan, and Mahalo Nui Loa from my Hawaiian. Talofa. <laughs> joining us today, and do come back. Um, we're going to have our January gathering here on January 21st, so we look forward to having everyone back in circle again, Sandy? On the 19th, our, oh, our sacred circle. January 19th, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Do we have to end the call? Do we have to end the series? You no, hang up first. But I, I'm seeing, uh, seeing that, that people who have been watching have now, who weren't a part of World Pulse, now are, and are telling others and their family and so, you know, even if we're going to say this is closing our circle, obviously the influence that you three have and the resources that you have, and thanks to Sandy and her wonderful newsletter and getting this all out, I mean, the ripple effect is going to go on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm.